So my official reason for changing the talk uh, is that uh, the, I, I, me and my co-authors, we talked already about combinatorial theory a lot. The secret reason, which where secret with a camera is not really a secret, uh, but uh, is that f this is about a paper for which I got um, a, a positive referee report yesterday, and I have to read it again, and so I, well, so <laughs> um, this is my, my, my reason for, 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 for talking about this subject. And it's something, so I want to start with a very basic problem. And it, it was an open problem until recently, but I always somehow, um, after, after trying this with a friend for a day, it's, I, I, I didn't understand why it was open for so long. Um, so the problem starts as follows. Uh, you um, you are in RD, okay. So you have an origin, um, and now I give you d plus one um, sets of vertices or sets of points, um, each with their own color. So let's say one of color blue, such that e the convex hull of each contains the origin with some imagination. All right. So this could be one. Um, this could be another one, um, and um, this could be yet another one. Well, again, imagination, like this. Okay. No, no, no. So d plus one is the number of color classes, and then I give you. You, you can just add any number of points. But each of the convex hulls of the each of the monochromatic convex hulls really contains the origin. Okay. Uh, it, it, the problem will be for a finite number because I want to estimate a certain combinatorial thing. So why is this just one problem? Huh? Why is this just one problem? It's the origin. It's the origin. It's so. No, 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 no. I just want to, to so the, the condition is that for e the, 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 verti the points of each color set taken on its own to contain the origin in its interior. And this is why I marked it so they can draw it. Okay, um, this is, uh, so d plus one colors, um, each color containing the origin. in the convex hull. Um, and now what we want to, to, to ask, how, how often is this, this the origin covered um, if we only want to count colorings by rainbow simplices? OK, so what would be a rainbow simplex? Well, I want to, to have a, a simplex on three vertices now that has, uh, that has where the vertices are somehow um, distributed over the colors. So this would be one example, right? So I want to count these kind of simplices. That's very simple, the question. Um, so OK, so there should be now some so there is some, 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 it depends a little whether you ask now whether you want to contain it in the interior of this, of this of colorful simplex or in the boundary. But I will just assume that these color sets, they are in relative general position to each other, okay? It doesn't really matter for the problem, but it makes it simpler. So I can, each color set on, on its own, I perturb by some, by, by some small linear transformation. Okay, so then, then, it's, then for the rest of the talk, I'm fine actually for the rest of the first part of my talk. So, okay, so, um, so how many um, uh, rainbow simplices containing the origin can there maximally be? So let's somehow, because later I want to do some, some, some applications of intersection theory. I, 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 
force myself to make the first part of the talk interactive. So what is your guess? Maximally. So I want to, to bound the complexity from above later in certain tomorrow I want to 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 to, to bound the, 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 the size of certain uh, manifolds with given boundary. From since above. you never you never upper bounded the sizes of the sets themselves. Well okay, so, so what terms? Okay, so so what I want to in terms of let me let, let's let's in terms of the uh, the number in i, which is just in the cardinality of the color set, v i, well i um, goes from one to d plus one. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, no. <laughs> the product is a good idea. Uh, so we could try. What's this? So a product. Let's try try to realize uh, the product. All right. Um, do you have a, conf a configuration that you would propose? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so simplex. Yeah. Um, the simplex. The simplex has one deficit, right? Ah, what's this color? No, it's not a good color. Um, what did I have? Green. No, this. OK, the simplex has one deficit. It doesn't quite satisfy the assumptions, right? No, I mean, in every, in every point of the simplex, you put an equal number of each color. Um, OK. That's a good suggestion. Um, let's stay with this configuration for a second. So let's take this configuration, but force it to be admissible by saying, OK, I take one of the points in here, um, one of these, put it here, mm -hmm. and one of these, put it here. OK? So then what I get is the product of ni minus 1 plus 1. OK? And OK, so you might conjecture that this is the upper bound. Um, and I want to give a very basic proof of this. And then I want to later uh, sketch how this embeds into a more general, a more sophisticated theory. Um, OK, so this is very simple. Um, what, is a, what is the basic idea? Well, I want to define uh, three simplicial complexes, or rather two simplicial complexes and one collection of faces. So A, um, this will just be the, um, the, 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 the collection of all stupidly admissible sets. So what I take is I take um, Ni points for, for each, so Na point, Ni disjoint points for each of the color sets. And then I take the join of these sets. All right, so I take the, so this is just the numbers from 1 to Ni, and I take the join of these, of these sets. OK, so these would be, if you count the number of maximum simplices, this would be just the product. This is everything that is in a very, in a very naive way admissible. Uh, sure. So I want to, so this is a collection of simplices. Uh, so let me define this correct, uh, directly in this case, because this is the only thing we need. So this is the collection of um, um, AI. Uh, I want, let me, let me see. So I want to um, go over some subset S of 
the index set from 1 to d plus 1. Um, and I want to say, OK, so i, i, uh, j, this is a collection of a, i, j, where j, go, where j, j is in s, and i is in, well, sorry, i is in n, i. OK, so this is, I take a point of, I take one element from every set, OK, and this gives me a simplex, but I, I'm, I'm allowed to, to leave out elements here. So I'm, I'm, I'm allowed to, to not take an element from the set first set or the second set, and so on. So this is a simplicial complex. OK? So as a space, if I put to an arm something very big. Yeah, yeah, you just take, yeah, just the union of the convex halt. Yeah, yeah, precisely. Um, so now I want to look at. G, this is a collection of good simplices. So these are simplices of A containing the origin. So this is not a simplicial complex. But if we take out these simplices, so these are just maximal simplices, then I'm left with a complex B. So this is thing good. This is the bad guy, the bad complex. So this is a the simplices not containing the origin. OK, and that's simple enough. OK, so now let's do some basic topology. What's the Euler characteristic of this uh, complex A? So how many vertices do I have? OK, so how many? I have one empty set. I, how many vertices do I have? It's just the sum of these elements, OK? So now, how many edges do I have? It's just the sum of possible two element subsets in here, OK, and so on. So what's the guess? <coughs> Product of n i minus 1. All right? Um, what's the Euler characteristic? of the bad complex. Well, this is, not e this is not easily combinatorial. However, what happens to um, Betty numbers? Um, so what, what non-trivial Betty numbers can we have? Let's ask it this way. So what non-trivial Betty numbers can I possibly have in this bad complex? Can I have a non-trivial d minus second Betty number? So what does not containing the origin have to do with the Betty numbers? Well, OK, so what did I, so I start with this complex, and I take out facets. So what are the Betty numbers here? It's a join of, of points. So the, the only the top homology can be non-trivial, right? So now I take out facets. Right? So what can I do? What can this do to the homology? Well, it can only create some homology in dimension d minus 1 or d. Right? But uh, other, uh, the, other are not, the other ones are not, not affected. So this is td minus 1 times minus 1 to the d minus 1. So this is not so important. Plus beta d. Uh, of, so this is always of the bad complex, right? But I'm just saying that all the other Betty numbers are, are, are trivial. Betty d of b times minus 1 to d. OK? Um, OK, but uh, what, what, what do you conclude for the, for the cardinality of g, then? This is the betas of b. Right? 
why are the okay? So why why are the other ones zero? So the join is clearly a d is has no has no homology up to dimension d minus one, right? Is this clear? Okay. Okay. Uh, I I leave it out. It's okay. So uh, it's reduced. It's okay. Yeah. 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 Why couldn't it be disconnected? I already had multiple components. Well, because it's uh, sorry. So, I, is it clear that A is connected? Oh, because you're just removing. But I, I just removed top-dimensional okay. faces, right? It's it's very simple. So, what, what is what is what is what is G then? What do I conclude? Well, I, it's just somehow G is somehow the Euler characters. These, these are just open cells of dimension of dimension D, right? So there's really nothing here to do. So this is just the product of the ni minus 1 um, plus uh, beta d minus 1. So you have to be careful with the signs here. But this somehow here, another sign comes in. It is precisely the sign of beta d um, of b minus uh, beta uh, d of beta d of b. OK? That's it. Um, so we w if we want to show that that um, the product plus one is the maximum that I can ever attain, I would have to show that uh, this Betty number can be at most one. OK? And now we do some very, very basic uh, stratified series. So that's somehow, well, so stratified in those most Novikov theory, but it's not so important. It's really something that you can do in a very discrete way. Um, so we want to prove uh, want to prove that Betty d minus one of b is at most one. It will be actually precisely one, but this is not so. That's so important. Um, OK, so how do we do this? Um, well, if you don't know how to do it, then let's do it for, for some example. And I unfortunately deleted the example. No, or did it? Wait. No, I deleted it, unfortunately. Sorry. Um, here we are going to use the fact that it contains the only. Yeah. Precisely. So I'm, a, I'm saying that the only uh, d minus first homology cycle that you can create comes out of taking out the origin, right? So that just some other, that the only homology cycle, precisely the homology cycle of the of the of our d minus the origin. So it's it, well, it's very simple. So let's say um, let's start. With, sorry, I, I deleted it, which was very stupid. So let me do this again. Uh, oh, the the. Oh, sorry. The, this and this configuration, and you see, you can see this rather easily. So this is really, um, sorry, blue, red, orange. So all these simplices you have, all these simplices you have, all these simplices you have, and you can see that somehow really there is only one homology cycle here. Right, it's simpler. So now, in, in dimension two, I would want to show that there's only one homology cycle, and I just showed it for this example. Um, um, let's do this also, just somehow because it's very simple for the plane. Because it, then it's e even more, more easy to even easier to see. So here's my. So this is in the line, right? And this is another configuration, like this. Um, and you see that somehow the, the set somehow the 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 bad complex is just two disjoint components and each of these is connected because it's just a join of some non-trivial sets here. Okay, so this is this proves the the, the, the these two basic cases. Well, it, it proves really the plane, but here I only showed it for an example, right? So how do how would I prove it? Uh, in general, well, I start with a configuration I like and I deform it. And I analyze the changes on homology using some basic loss theory. So it's really something 
uh, be something very easy. Uh, so let me. Yes, but wait. So I mean, you have to incorporate some geometry, right? Uh, yeah. There is some something not trivial, but uh, this is really somehow. Uh, maybe there is a more elementary proof. For it. It's actually somehow the proof is really simple. Let's let's go through it. It's it's very. Um, I don't know whether you can find a more beautiful proof than than this. Yeah. 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 Hmm? No, it's not a homotopy equivalence. So, for instance, uh, the Betty D's can be not trivial. Ah. So this is precisely. So this is an exact bound, right? This is not only. This is not not a not a bound. This is a formula, right? And in, in indeed, you can find configurations where this is lower than maximal. Um, let me let me give an example. Um, so here I claim that you can find configurations with non-trivial first Betty number, right? So what I do is I take this and I add another point here. So now if you look on this side, you have really a quadrangle on four points, right? So the, the join is really these four points, right? And joined like this. And so you have a non-trivial first Betty number. So the, the bound is precisely off by one, OK? So it is. It's not so. It's not so much of equivalence. Um, and but in, indeed, you, you, we use some kind of fiber theorem now. So let's do this. Um, so let's see. We so you, you start with the configuration that you can handle. So this could be the configuration that you know. It's a good configuration because here the Betty D is a trivial, so it's really easy to find out that the Betty D minus one is precisely one. And now you move the points. Okay, so when does the when does the the, the, the homology change? Let's do the dimension two case in detail. So uh, when does the, when do the Betty numbers of the uh, of the bad complex change? Well, what can happen is that you have an so some edge of the bad complex moves past the origin, all right? So it could look like this. So this is this is the edge of the bad complex. Um, and now, it moves past the origin. So these are these are the color triangles. So this is somehow this is a back uh, bad uh, an edge of the back complex of on colors. Uh, um, red and blue, and then you have some other green vertices here, right? And now you move past the origin. So before these complexes were in G, and these complexes, or these simplices were in B, but now it changes, right? So what is the homology that you can possibly create here? Well, the, the homology really corresponds just to the to the attaching one-dimensional cycle here. So these are the cycles that you can create, right? And you, you don't create anything, anything in dimension, any one-dimensional cycle on this side, right? So these, sim these simplices you add, right? You could only kill possibly some, uh, some, some homology in dimension one. Here you remove one, and this can possibly create some cycles. So now, OK, so let's, let's see. So in this moment that I moved past this, so now I'm here, I could have created this homology cycle. Um, and um, I might be a little stuck for a second until I can, I, until I want to use a second Morse theory trick. What I do is I, I take a line um, through the origin, or in, in general a hyperplane, and I rotate it slightly. Okay, at some point this, this line will contain this red vertex. Okay, so I rotate it. And so if it contains the red vertex, so, or the hyperplane contains this red vertex, then it has, okay, so you, then you can project along this hyperplane, and then you have precisely, somehow, then you have again this configuration of the same kind in the projection, right? So you have um, some blue points on the, you have some, you, so you project along this line, so right, you, so you project to this line, and now you have some blue points here and some green points 
So you can use the induction assumption. You will see that on every side of this line, um, with respect to the origin, you will have a connected component. But this means that the, these, these two, um, the, 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 the critical, uh, the, 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 this one cycle at the critical locus that you created here must be boundary to some to some two-dimensional membrane, right? So to, it must be boundary to a two-chain. And now you just extend this along this MOS function, and you see that this must be actually trivial, by, by, by just by simple induction, OK? And this is, so you, so you used MOS theory twice, once by induction, once by, 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 by knowing it for, for, for a simple uh, configuration and then deforming it in general position, and then you're done. That's it. There's really nothing happening here. So the simple configuration I, I, I start with is I put all the color sets, colors on, on one simplex. But now I, this is not admissible, right? Because the color sets don't contain the origin. What I take is one point and I just move it here. Oh, it's a convection of all of them. Yeah. So why is this? I mean, if you don't want to compute the Betty number, if you do, don't want to compute uh, the Betty numbers here, you can just uh, check that you can just check the Betty number by this formula, and then count the bad simplices or the count the good simplices. Right? It's it's really something uh, purely purely numerical. But uh, there, there's really nothing there's really nothing happening here. So it's easy to see that the Betty number is at least one just because you created some non-trivial homology by removing the origin. And it can be at most one just because you can count the good simplices in this configuration and just uh, apply this formula there. That's it. That's, uh, the, there's really no mystery here. OK, good. So, so this is some, some, uh, uh, some, basic, some basic problem. It stayed open for 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 for. for uh, quite considerable amount of time, um, but uh, it's really easy to solve. But now I want to, to go to, to see this problem in a more general context. And what I do is now I, I use vector space duality, or what combinatorialists call Gale duality. So I have this point configuration, right? I have a, I have a point configuration of different colors. So um, I have some colors, some color sets V1, B2 and so on. And this is the color set. So this is in RD. So this is really some of this is uh, this is a matrix with D rows and sum of N i entries where the su where the where the N i really I are uh, in all interesting situations are larger than D. So now I can I can have I have this space and now I can just write down the annihilator of this of this matrix and this will get, complete my matrix to a d time uh, to a, to an n well to a, to a big n to a big n times n matrix. Yeah. V i is just a v one is every color. Okay. Okay. Precisely. Um, so, how does this? Uh, well, how does this help me? Well, now um, I have a dual configuration. So this is somehow this is a configuration of n big n points in R D, and I get a new configuration of big n points in R n minus D. Okay, and what it turns out, the the whole, huh? This is just vector space duality. It's no. no it's the kernel. Yeah, precisely. It makes the spaces for the kernel. Precisely. It can be. I mean, you have many traces. You put an arbitrary. Precisely, but the matroid is determined, or actually the oriented matroid, because I'm working over the reals. Okay, so the the, the relevant combinatorial data is determined. This is uh, the essence of what is called Gale duality. Right? Usually it's used in the other way around. So people want to try, you, people have some high dimensional, uh, high dimensional configuration with, where the number of vertices is almost the number of, of, of uh, uh, the almost equal to the dimension. And then they want to transfer this to studying many points in a low dimensional configuration. 
So this, co this process here is called gate duality. Um, okay, so how do we study this? Um, how, do we, how do we think of this configuration in Rn minus d? And this is actually really uh, simple. Let me state the problem that it corresponds to. Yeah, let me just say what it translates to. Um, and this is uh, the, the problem of complexity, also called the upper bound problem. problem for Minkowski sums of polytops. Um, so what's the problem here? Uh, well, OK, so I gave you um, m polytops. Um, P1 to Pm in Rd, and I want to maximize the number of faces um, of the Minkowski sum. Pi in terms of, well, I want to fix m, d, and the number of vertices of each summit. OK? Hmm? OK, sure. I can, I can, re I can uh, remind you of the Minkowski sum. So, Well, this is actually the, this is mixed facets. If you think about it, this is only uh, bounding the number of facets um, of of the Minkowski sum on certain simplicities in high dimensions. All right, I converted just uh, I converted the, the the dimensions here to be a little easier in notation, but this is really the the underlying problem. So, what is a Minkowski sum? Let's let me do some example. Actually, is it customary to do a break at yeah, some point? It's up to you. Uh, okay. Well, I can I can do it as in Jerusalem with a break. It's uh -huh. okay. So the Mikoski sum of two sets. This is really some a very important operation. So these are subsets in R D. Um, this is just the collection of sums, uh, so of 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 elements in in A. Big A and Big B. Okay. So let's say we have. Let's ma let me make some examples, and I want to really do the Minkowski sum of of polytopes of convex sets. Um, so let's say we have uh, this segment and this segment. What is the Minkowski sum? Yeah, it's a rectangle. If I add this element. Uh, yeah, precisely, it's hexagon. That's it. OK, so I promised uh, that the first hour is interactive. And I want to just sketch one example to see that this problem is highly, highly non-trivial. Um, so let's not even count the number of facets here. OK, let's just count the number of vertices of a, pos of a Minkowski sum. OK, so how many vertices do you think I can possibly have if I sum uh, uh, m polytops in RD? So 
So what's the trivial answer? What is the trivial upper bound? There's a product of the number of vertices, right? Because every, uh, so I want to say that, okay, so this here, this face I can exhibit by a hyperplane, this face I can exhibit by a hyperplane. So if I'm hopeful, then I could ask that every combination of these faces is exhibited, is, is maximized in the linear function. Okay, so this is somehow the, the, the most trivial upper bound. So let's try an example, and then I can go to the break. Actually, I can leave this example for the, as an exercise. <laughs> So let's try very basic. Let's try um, triangle plus another triangle. I don't give you the geometric position. So you can play with the geometric position. So what, what would be the maximal number of vertices in the Minkowski sum that you could expect? Nine, right? So can we have, can this have nine vertices? So what are the best what are the best constructions that you can give me? Let me wipe the board while you come up with some nice constructions with large number of vertices. Okay. This plus this. Yes. This you mean. So how many vertices do you have? Six. Six. Okay. Uh, anyone can give me more? Yeah. Well, uh, well, no, 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 no. Uh, but it's it's not the n is minus one. It's also the. It's a polygon with all the faces parallel to the faces of the two triangles, so it's minus six. Yeah. yeah. This is, so in, in dimension two, I cannot do I cannot do better. In dimension higher, well, if I do this in a very high dimension, then I can do better. But in dimension two, it's apparently that I cannot do it better. And again, I want to give, so let me start, let me start with some other, um, actually, let me take a break now. And then, no, let, no, no, no. Let, let, me, let me do this example. Let me give a. You have the front of your life. Uh, okay, then let's do a 10 minute, let me, let's do a 10 minute break now. It's okay, then let's, right. we, let's continue afterwards, okay. Now this is uh, the second part of we're doing it wrong and then we're doing it right. So let's try to to understand why this cannot have nine vertices. And it's a cute trick that is very that does that is very powerful. But for the fir before we we understand it really, we will use it in the wrong way. Um, so let's say we want to analyze the sum of two triangles, so the sum of m polytopes in R D. So what could be a useful tool for this, well, there's something called the Cayley surface or the Cayley polytope. Of the connection PI. And so how do I get this polytope? Well, I want to in some way encode the Minkowski sum. So what I do is I, I put this, my, my first polytope or every polytope of this, I, I put in a, in a parallel uh, subspace. So in the case of I have two summons in dimension two, then I put two summons in parallel hyperplanes. And now I take the convex hull of these two summons. Uh, I should make a larger picture. Let me see. Um, this and like this. And let me do it in 
Hala. So the convex hull will look like this. Okay. So how do I see the Minkowski style? Yeah, because they are cut just in the metal. All right. So um, if I look at this, uh, if I look at this com uh, at this polytope, so I, I really am I'm only interested in the sub in the in the open subcomplex of faces that intersect this hyperplane. Right. This I could call C of the family, really. So. C of pi, this is called the Cayley complex. And what do I have? Then, well, the number of, of K plus M faces of this, of, this, uh, of this Cayley complex is just the same as the number of K faces of the Minkowski sum. So the Cayley complex, I take this polytope, and now I take the open simplicial complex of all the faces or all the all of all the faces that intersect this uh, intersect this hyperplane here. Okay. So what the, uh, what I said earlier, this is somehow the, what I have here in this section is really uh, the sum of the polytops. So the Minkowski sum of the polytops da, 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 plus uh, pm. But uh, it's is scaled by a factor. But this is not really relevant. It's one by m. Okay. So that's that's it. Um, Okay, but this means that, the, that, I, that I really somehow, if I if I take an edge in this example, right, of this of this Cayley complex, it corresponds to a vertex of the Minkowski sum. Okay, that's that's uh, it's, uh, something very easy. By the way, why can I assume that this is a simplicial complex? Well, because I want to maximize the number of faces, so I can assume that all the vertices are in some or general position, right? If I have a polytop, then by wiggling the the summons, I can only de increase the number of faces. So really, so I can assume that this is simplicial. So let's do, try to, to understand why there cannot be uh, too many vertices. And then I try in the, in the wrong way, and then try to do it in the right way. Um, but the right way, somehow, in the right way, I, I will uh, uh, replace topology by some commutative algebra. So I don't know whether you would be happier. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Um, so let's let's recall. Uh, um, let's let's look at the polytope here. So this is a polytope in R D plus M, right? Where M is the number of summons again, and I have some number of uh, vertices. So the number of vertices. Um, let's let me assume that it is larger than D plus. Um, well, well what, what can I say? So if I, um, let's say what the number of vertices is larger than d plus m plus 2. Sorry, why is it, uh, why is it uh, d plus m when you do this? Uh, well, so for, OK, so yes. for two summons, you find two parallel hyperplanes. For three summons, you put it into three parallel co-dimension uh, two subspaces. And so on, right? That's it. No, it's d plus m. So you have a one polytope. Ah, no. Oh, so you, you're right. Sorry, you're right. Okay. So let's assume that the number of uh, vertices for a moment is larger than or equal to d plus m plus one. Um, well, then what do I have? Well, then I can apply Radon's theorem. And this means that uh, I can partition is a partition of the vertex sets, so the union of the vertex sets of the PI into two subsets. Um, um, what, what are my two subsets? Let me just call them uh, W and W prime, such that such that the convex hulls intersect. Convex hulls intersect. All 
OK? And this I can do for every subcollection of d plus m plus 1 points here, which I can distribute over the summons here. OK, but what does this mean? Well, the, the convex holes intersect. Then I, I select the small o of these two sets. This can be of size at most m minus 1. But then this corresponds to a face that does not intersect, that, does not, that is not in the boundary of the KD polytope when I intersect it with this hyperplane. OK, so in particular, this means that number, there is a vertex, uh, vertex of, uh, oh, sorry, there is a non-vertex of the Minkowski sum. So some choice of vertices of the summons that do, does not sum to a vertex of the Minkowski sum. So let's see when this, is, when this condition is naturally satisfied. Well, if I have d polytopes in, uh, if I have m, m d-dimensional polytopes, then the number of vertices, so if I have m d-dimensional polytopes, then the number of vertices here, well, this ver number of vertices is uh, um, just d, uh, just d, d times m, right? Uh, d plus 1 times m. OK? And it turns out that now it is easy, easy to check that there is a subcollection that will not define a face by just this argument. OK, in particular, as in particular, you can conclude that if m is larger or equal to d, then the number of vertices of the Minkowski sum i is strictly smaller than the product of the vertices, product of the n i. What is Harron's theorem? Harron's theorem is that if you have d plus, po okay, so d plus two points in R d, then you can partition it in these, this point set into two parts such that the convex hulls of these two, two, two sets intersect. So something very basic. It's, uh, And I use it to just I, I use it to show that there is some some uh, face of the some some collection of vertices of the Cayley polytope um, which lie will lie in the interior because will be, it will be the intersect with the convex hull of some other collection of vertices here and then but then it must must be already a, a, an edge in the interior and cannot be in the boundary of the Cayley polytope therefore it cannot be corresponding to the, to to to, uh, to to a to a face of the Minkowski sum, so right? Just show that uh, for two, two triangles you you cannot have more than eight. But, uh, precisely, yeah. Not six. Yeah, precisely. So how do I show that it's six? Um, and it turns out that the right way to do it is some interesting algebra. Um, However, I have to, 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 show, to, to show you at least one basic, uh, one basic uh, way to do it first, just to, to mark. I will try to, to explain it a little. I don't know well how far I get uh, um, in a reasonable, for a reasonable explanation. Um, so what I want to sketch to you is I want to um, solve the following problem uh, by, by McMullen, so Peter McMullen. Well, um, and this is the case when m is equal to 1. Um, so I want to just ask, if, you, uh, if I give you just a, a simplicial polytope, or polytope on the given number of vertices, how do I maximize the number of faces in each dimension? OK, and um, I want to, to, to introduce the algebraic toolkit there. And then I, after this, I can, I can sketch how, to, how, do, how do you solve this problem in a tight way for Minkowski sums. OK, so what do we do? So what I will, I will uh, um, um, so explicitly, what is the maximal number of faces of given dimension of dimension i for a simplicial polytope? 
FD polytope on N vertices. The this is the upper bound theorem. Okay. Yeah. There is a, so there is a simpler proof than the final There is a simpler. You, you don't want to use that. Uh, no, no, no. There is a simpler proof than Stanley's, right? Oh, okay. This is also a very simple, but it's not uh, good enough for the Minkowski yeah, sum. Uh, so I want to actually even not do the proof by McMullen. I want to do the even harder proof by Stanley, unfortunately. Okay. Um, <laughs> Simplicial just means that the vertices are all in general position. Uh, the combinatorial type is stable under permutation. So under wiggling the vertices or another way to uh, simply see, precisely. OK, so how do we do this? Um, I, will, I will go very slowly, so don't worry. It's, um, so um, let's assume that i is less or equal to d half. So what is uh, the maximum I can expect for fi minus 1 of p? What's your best guess? Well, I could just try to have every subset, right? Every subset of size i be a be a simplex form a simplex of the polytope, right? So what would what would this get me? Is uh, just n just uh, n choose i, right? Um, okay. It turns out that this can be realized. So this is uh, this is tight. And realized by the cyclic polytope. And this is a very beautiful construction. So, what I take is a moment curve of, ga of t. This is a, just a nice degree uh, d curve uh, t, t square, da, 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 t to the d in Rd. Right, and I take n points on this curve. curve. On, on the moment curve, well, the, the image of. OK? And now I take the convex hull. And it turns out that this is uh, somehow very, very easy to check that this attains, at least for i less or equal to d half, I attain this bound. Why, cannot, why can't I have? Uh, this bound, uh, why can't I attain this bound for, for i larger than d half? How? How do you see this? It's already on the blackboard, so it's. So, so if I take just a simplex, then it's clearly true. But I want to say that if the number of vertices is larger than the number of the simplex, Right. If the for the simplex, I can actually attain this bound for all the i, right? So, but uh, if I have d plus two vertices, then I have Radon theorem. I take again the smaller of the two, um, the smaller of the two uh, partitions, and this has an interior. Of, uh, somehow this this corresponds to to a face in the interior of your convex polytope, that uh, that has a nice property that uh, it cannot form a face, and therefore you cannot attain this bound. Very simple. Right. Uh, so now I want, but I want to 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 to, to understand what is the maximum I, that I can have for the um, for the upper bound for the for the, for for the for, for 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 i larger or equal to d half, and um, then you look up Wikipedia, and you find out that there are relations between. The, the entries of i lower than d half and i larger than d half. Okay, so the, these relations are called the Dane sum of the relations. Um, and I say that I have to look it up on Wikipedia because I really had to look it up on Wikipedia because I never remember them this way. Uh, I will tell you a, a better way to remember them in a second. So i minus, uh, I minus 1 to the j 
j plus 1, k plus, choose k plus 1, going from j equal k to d minus 1, um, if j um, is equal to um, uh, minus 1 to the d minus 1 um, fk for all k, well, mean for all, or well, minus 1, which is equal to k, less or equal to d minus 2. Um, okay. Um, you might not see it, and I don't, well, I don't uh, somehow, uh, I don't also like this formula, but what you can see is that you can compute all the entries of, 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 the, ve of, this, of the phase numbers, all, all these fi for i larger than d half, by a simple inversion of this formula from the entries uh, for i lower than d half. That's an easy thing. The problem is, of course, that you, you already see that this, this formula will not have, uh, the, this formula will not present the, the, to the coefficients in the upper half as a positive sum or non-negative sum of the coefficients of the lower half. So really you haven't gained anything because now, because you can't, if, if you had non-negative coefficients, right, then upper bounds on the lower half then would give you upper bounds on the, up, uh, would give you the fi in the upper half. But this is uh, simply not true. Yeah. The equation, the number of variables. Yeah. So why can you compute the, I mean, so if you know all the ones uh, for Because then. Uh, oh, you don't, you don't want yeah. to compute, you want the upper bound. Precisely. No, okay. Um, okay. So, for all simplicial polytopes, for all actually simplicial spheres, but that's not good. Yeah. No, they are not really independent. What? They are not independent. No. So what's the rank of the system? Oh, it actually, it has been. Some of this is something right. Uh, there are. I mean, not lie. I think so. So you can compute all the possible linear relations between between phase numbers of simplicial spheres and simplicial polytopes, and this behaves very nicely because it turns out to be Fibonacci number. I don't know somehow there might be some. I don't know what the indexing is precisely, but you can actually compute all the number, all the possible relations. But these are really a subspace of the of the possible relations. Right. These are just the half-dimensional subspace, so d half. So the rank is that. Yeah, precisely. Let me let me make it clear. So um, it's somehow the, it's convenient to define a second vector. So H K of of my polytope, and this is defined as follows. Um, I, I I take a polynomial relation as a definition. This is very convenient. H K minus H K from H D minus one to K equals zero t to the d minus k, and this i set equal to i equals 0 to d minus 1 for f i minus 1. Um, ah, sorry. f i minus 1 times t minus 1 to the d minus i. OK, so this gives you this vector. Uh, you can just compute this explicitly using the standard uh, Pascal trick, right? So you can F i minus one ah h k times t to the d minus k. Okay. okay, so these are two polynomials. So um, how do we compute this explicitly? So you take uh, you write uh, these entries into um, into a diagonal f0, f1, and so on, up to fd minus one, and now you take uh, iteratively the, the 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 difference between the 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 two adjacent entries. So this one minus this one is the same as this one. 
this one minus this one, so this the next entry here would be uh, f0 minus f, f minus 1, and so on. And then after you did this, you end up here with h0 to h uh, d. HD? Yeah. OK. Uh, sorry. Uh, what do you mean? No, what I, I don't know what, what, what you by, mean by the word association. Um, I don't know. Okay. I, uh, I think about uh, how um, uh, you don't know. We are looking at two bases. Yeah. Some, or some subbases. And you want, uh, you want a nice base. This, you don't like these bases because the relations are uh, have negative coefficients. Yeah. You want to move to another basis. Yeah, but this is not. Yeah, I mean, these are different numbers. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, I will explain you how to interpret these numbers. Maybe this satisfies you later. Okay, so um, you can also do the same thing with the h numbers, and then you have to sum every entry, so h0 to hd, and then you have to sum these entries, so you have to, this, this entry is the sum of these two entries. And this in particular means that the phase numbers fi are the sum of the non negative coefficients of these h numbers. OK, that's, that's the whole thing that you can draw out of this. So if you can bound these h numbers uh, from in, in, in a nice way from above, then you also bounded the f numbers. Um, why is this useful? Well, now I can find, I can, I can uh, define the Dane summable relation in the way I like them. Um, so the Dane summable, which are pretty horrible here, are now just hk is equal to hd minus k. OK? It's, uh, it's one of these things that have, has to do with Poincaré duality, but we don't need it here. So now, the, if I have an, upper, an entry in the upper half, I can bound it in a positive sum. Well, not only a positive <coughs> sum. It's really the same as, uh, as an entry in the lower half. OK, so now I, what I have to show um, is really just an upper bound on the hk in the lower half. And this is uh, um, one of these uh, one of these nice algebraic tricks. Um, okay, so how do I do this? So I define a ring. So I want to define a ring A of P. And this is defined as follows. I take a polynomial ring over the reals. And here I say that the variables, they are associated to vertices of, of p. So if I have n vertices and the vertices are indexed in for 1 to n. Um, and now I take out of this ring an ideal i of delta. So i of delta is defined by saying um, that uh, is, gen is generated by monomials of the form x to the alpha, such that the support of alpha is not in my in the is not a face in P. All right. So this is a very thing, very canonical thing to do if you want to talk about the simplicial complex. Right. So you take this ring that encodes everything, and now you take out everything that doesn't belong to your simplicial polytope. Um, And now you add to this another ideal. Um, and this alpha is only zeros and ones, right? What? These alphas? No, no, no. Well, yeah, you can actually show the, choose that to be zeros and ones. That's, that's correct, yeah. Because other, the, everything else is every higher degrees in the, in, the, in the ideal generated by this. So that's fine, yeah. Precisely, I associate to each vertex a variable. Um, and then I add an ideal L um, and L is generated by the global linear functions. On RD 
by which I mean that, okay, so you have your vertices of the polytop in some way distributed in Rd. And now you get your coefficients by, by just evaluating some linear function or, um, on Rd. So you take some linear function Rd to the reals and now evaluate it at the vertices. And this gives you some linear, fun some linear, uh, some, 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 some degree one function here. This is now, and the collection of all the functions that you get this way generates you the ideal L. Okay, so this is something that is very geometric and very canonical. Um, and what you observe now is, or observe is good, because this is a, a rather tricky, well, at the time it was rather tricky. So this is Reisner, uh, Stanley. And that's, um, well, this ring is graded, right? And each, each graded component is, you can see as a real vector space, so you can just look at its dimension. So you can look at this. A ring A of P, and you can look at the dimension, it's a real vector space of the degree K component, and this is HK. Okay, that's simple enough. Okay. Um, so, how does this help me? Well, this ring that I have there is also generated in degree one. It's commutative. Um, it, yeah, so this is A is generated in degree one. In uh, how many generators? My OTC is minus T precisely. Thanks. <laughs> So what does this mean what, for how, mu how large can this possibly be? So if it's not so. So n minus d minus 1 plus k choose k is one of these somehow things that you have to remind yourself of that are gone beyond the usual <laughs> binomial. OK, so but this means, OK, so it turns out that this is, if you transform this back to the face numbers, this is precisely for the lower entries, it's precisely the, in, the bound that you want. And, but this also gives you the entry for the, the, the bound for the higher entries. So this solved the problem, OK? That's it. Um, so this algebra makes it very simple to solve. Um, to solve this upper bound problem, so this is precisely the Stanley's proof. So how does this help me if I if I want to to study Minkowski sums? Well, yeah, but then somehow okay. So the, now here here the trick was that somehow the the H. Uh, the HKs, um, they are uh, represented in some, in, um, in some, 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 some of the HKs for the, for the higher entries are represented by, by HKs of the lower entries. And th this means that this, this gets very simple, but the, 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 the algebra will help us uh, for, for Minkowski sums in a very mo much more sophisticated way. There is, a, it's a, there is a very cool convolution, convolution on the level of, 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 of the standard Riesner rings if we pass, once we pass to the Cayley complex and the Cayley polytope. So let's now so return to the Cayley polytope. So um, let me leave this definition there. Um, in the definition of the of the ring, so this this algebraic object is is my, it's canonically associated uh, to 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 simplicial complexes. You can also work hard and find a nice algebraic object that is associated to non simplicial to, to to general polyhedral complexes, but then you have to pass. So this is kind of this is kind of the cohomology of a certain variety. Okay, but if you want to go to the non-simplicial, you have to inter you have to go from cohomology to intersection cohomology, and this is much much harder to work with. Uh, so there is no canonical algebraic picture, but you want I want to avoid it at any cost. Anyway, for the upper bound theorem, 
it's you can assume simplicial, right? Because you can always increase the number of faces by wiggling the vertices into general position. But uh, you're right. I'm I'm hiding this on temperature under the rug. It's, this is it's very important still, but it's not something that um, I think I could explain in this in the remaining half hour or so. Yeah. So let's remind ourselves of the situation. We had some, some simplicial complex associated to the, to the problem of solving Minkowski, uh, Minkowski sum. The, the, this, uh, this problem of Minkowski sums, this problem of upper bound, the, the upper bound problem for Minkowski sums. Uh, um, and um, now we claim that there should be a nice ring picture to analyze this. So how do we do this? Well, OK, so I have an open simplicial complex um, that is some other, it's, it's really, you can think of it as a pair of a simplicial complex and a subcomplex. So what is a subcomplex? So um, the, the, the simplicial complex is, uh, the, let, let me denote it by pi, i, um, i, and m. Let me call this. index set. Okay. So this was uh, the, the open simplicial complex, but now I take its closure. So I take all the faces here as well. Okay, so this this is so now I, I basically just I, I, I force it to be down closed. I force it to be an order ideal. Okay. Um, so now I have really a simplicial complex and now I could apply this, uh, this this construction here. But I really only want to look at the faces that um, that are intersecting the this 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 object in the in in the middle. So what I take is this union uh, is 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 this modulo its boundary um, boundary c bar, which is just the union of um, of Cayley polytopes. So it closures of Cayley polytopes um, c of p i where i all goes over a collection s, where, which is a strict subset of the original index set. OK? So this is a relative, it's a pair of simplicial complexes now. Yes, precisely. This is what it shows, right? Yeah. So, OK, so let me, let me say it again. So what does this show? The cyclic polytope say, uh, uh, maximizes the lower entries, right? But what this shows is that after the, the transformation of H numbers, this also maximizes the upper entries. So this is actually a very cool thing. So these polytopes that maximize the lower entries, I, be, I up to D half, uh, they also maximize the upper entries. This same thing will happen here, but it's, uh, um, it's actually something very interesting that pops up in all kinds of, um, so why, let me give you some short motivation of why you want to, to understand Minkowski sums of polytopes. So one thing is that if you want to compute uh, zeros, you want to bound this, uh, the, the intersection of certain, of certain varieties, you want to bound the zeros of some polynomial, then there is something cool that's called the Bernstein formula. Um, and there you want to, to bound the mixed volume in some way. And the mixed volume is just counting some other, you want to, to, to control the, mixed fa the, the faces of some Minkowski sum. And if you do this, well, then you can write on a nice bound. So the Minkowski sum, this, this, the, this, this upper bound theorem for Minkowski uh, sums comes in. Then there's something. Um, the, well, the, already the number of vertices of a Minkowski sum, as you saw, is, uh, is something that is non trivial, right? right. So this well, is. That's what uh, happens there, right? Yeah, the, precisely. Yeah. Um, the number of facets is, is important for 
for counting certain complete intersections of, of, uh, of as far as I know, people apply it mostly to tropical varieties, but I think that's, so, uh, so this comes in, in, in uh, for, for bounding certain complex, uh, complete intersections. There is, uh, it, it comes in in, um, in, the, in, in some, some completion problems of matrices. So um, there you want to, actually, I, so you want to do, you have some pattern matrix and you want to complete, you want to complete the, the, the matrix given some conditions on the rank, and then you can also reduce this to some problem of Minkowski sum. So this problem in the, I, I, of, 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 of bounding the complexity or understanding the complexity of a Minkowski sum, it pops up over all kinds of cases. So now I just talked to Peter's, Peter wanted to come with here, some, uh, some doctor's visit. So Peter, oh, with Peter I discussed, there is another problem if you want to, 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 to compute zeros of the Riemann zeta function. Uh, in a very fast way, and you also want to count. The, you want to understand convolutions of moment curves, and these co convolutions of moment curves can precisely come out of Minkowski sums of these of certain trigonometric moment curves. And this uh, again, somehow you want to understand these. And this is also this 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 Cayley surface and the Cayley polytope. This gives you an enumerative way to to do this in a nice way. Uh, so th it pops up all, all kinds of places. So I'm sorry. I think you told me yesterday that I should modify, motivate nicely, but I could spend like two hours on the motivations alone. So it's uh, a. <laughs> um, uh, so this is a relative Fisher complex, right? So this is um, very nice. It actually is somehow it's it's very nice for several reasons because this uh, every component here. So every of these. Of these elements is an induced subcomplex, right? It's an induced subcomplex of its vertex set. So um, every face. So look, let's look at this example. So every face between vertices, um, between vertices of, of the slower of this summand is actually a face of this summand, right? So there's no face like this, right? It's uh, something that is rather interesting that comes in in the algebra rather nicely. So now you can look at this. You can look at this. You, how would you define the Stenuista ring of this object? Well, you, let's call this delta, um, and let's call this gamma. So what would you do if if you, if you don't know how to help yourself? Well, you can look at the kernel of of a delta to a gamma. Okay. So this you could this is not no longer a ring, it's a nice module. This is a nice module over uh, over the um, over the original Stenuisner ring of our Rx. Um, and you can try to study this and there are all kinds of nice things. Um, so one of the important things of this, let me call this, let me call this, uh, let me denote this by A. Of of uh, let me call let me actually denote it by M for module of the collection CPI. Okay, um, and uh, well, so there are several facts. So first theorem is due to Schenzel, and f what Schenzel said. Okay, um, if you have not something not a, not a polytope but a manifold. Then you can show that um, the dimension, that the face numbers, fi, these are positive, non-negative sums of the dimension, uh, dimension of of the dimension vector of the uh, of, of or entries of the dimension vector of this module, um, ci, in over certain degrees. Um, let me not write on the complete formula because I always make mistakes. Plus some uh, correction term, um, only depending on the homology. On the homology of of this complex CI. But this some of this this com the homology of this complex CI is rather simple, right? This is really just a sphere of of some dimension and easy to say, uh, to understand. So this is, so again, there is this algebraic way to compute the face numbers in a nice way. Um, however, there is something even nicer that you can observe now. Um, uh, 
Well, you can look at what, what is this module, really. Um, and this module, really, you can write it as um, the quotient of the non-phase ideal of the join of these vertex sets and i modulo the 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 the, no, the 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 product of the ideals generate of the non-phase ideals of the summons. Okay, so sorry, the sum of the non-phase ideals of the summons. So sum of the i i i i p i, and then you have to take out this global linear ideal. Um, and what does this mean? Well, if you work very hard, then this means that um, m in of m of c i in degree k k larger than half larger than the threshold for for the uh, the for the Minko for for the for the Rallon theorem, which is d plus m minus one half. Um, is a convolution is equal to a convolution of the mi uh, of of the modules for these collections. Sorry, pi. Let me make this i in m for the convolutions pi uh, cp. Pi, where now go over i in subsets, in strict subsets of the index set, of the original index set. So this means that uh, if you work this out, then. What do you mean by convolution? So there is a nice. Okay, so um, I was thinking about writing this down explicitly. Um, what I'm saying is that you can. Um, Essentially, you can understand the, the if you go above this the threshold that is given the, by the Poincaré duality or by Radon theorem, then you can understand the ring of of uh, or the, the sorry the module of this of the of this uh, of this Cayley polytope of Minkowski sum in terms of the modules of summons here. Okay, so there is a certain way that you can determine the ring from all the summons, but strict summons. Okay, so this means that you can actually do some nice induction by, by using this algebra. So the, the, the conclusion that you get here is that actually um, the dimension of this in k larger than d plus m minus 1 half are actually non-negative sums uh, or so non-negative combinations of, of the dimension, dimensions here. So this is somehow... Um, um, so the dimension of this m m c p i i in m is a non-negative combination of um, the dimensions of subsummons of subsums. For k larger or equal to d uh, plus m minus one half. So There's an explicit formula that takes three lines to write down. So it's uh, this is this is actually something very interesting that pops up. Uh, so also in this calculation that uh, Peter wants to do, um, you you add moment curves. Many moment curves, and you want to understand what's what actually what are the summons uh, that contribute? What are the what are the summons? The, the possible ways to, to 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 write one one point in the in the Minkowski sum as sum of elements in the in the original moment curve, and it turns out that if once once the number of uh, of n gets high, this this kind of this gets a very this, this becomes a very complicated convolution. And you can so in the end, if you go with n to infinity, what you get is some 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 some, uh, some Gaussian distribution. So you cannot really recover anything. So in the limit, n goes to infinity, while d, m goes to infinity, while d is fixed. You get something very complicated. Uh, but writing down this this convolution. No, no, no. This is not taking the convex hull. But you can. 
Precisely, yeah. But uh, what uh, what you are, what you want to understand is um, uh, really just this boundary surface here, right? The boundary of this uh, of this Minkowski sum, and this is or uh, this this convolution that, that pops up in my case, my discrete case, and what what pops up in this case is 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 closely related. Although he uses somehow he doesn't want to use the convolution measure, but he wants to use a measure coming from uh, random uniform matrices. But uh, okay, so then. Um. So just back to this. Uh, so for the, the equation you showed us is extremely simple. In the case n equals one, just h h k is h k minus k. Yeah. What is it for two? Is it simple for two? No, it's already it's somewhat. Already it's already very complicated. Um, so this is something we we. we in the paper, we only give a recursion formula. So how to do this for, for m summons, if you know to, for, for know it for m minus 1 summons. And this is already complicated. There are people that worked out an explicit formula, but it's also not so nice. It's uh, some, it's, uh, there seems to be some hardness of computation here, but I, don't, I, I never thought about making this uh, explicit. OK, so what is? Uh, let me just write down the end theorem. So theorem, and this is myself and Sanya. Um, so fi of the Minkowski sum of the polytopes um, is less or equal to fi of the Minkowski sum of certain cyclic polytopes. On ni vertices, where these points are chosen in general position and perturbed according to a to 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 a, to, to a certain algebraic rule. So, but let me write down the, the property that has that this Minkowski sum has. So, um, what is the property for for every for every s subset of the index set and for every um, Fi collection of vertices um, in uh, collection of vertices in, in Pi such that the sum of the vertices sum of the cardinalities of Fi uh, is less or equal to um, D plus size of S um, minus one half um, you, the, let me write it down here. Um, the Minkowski sum of the Fi um, is a face of, um, sorry, this is cyclic, is a face of the Minkowski sum of the cyclic polytopes. Um, and this means that basically, okay, so what am I saying? Um, again, the moment curve, certain points on the moment curve uh, maximize the number of faces. So this is regardless of, of this i here. Um, oh, sorry. Um, and uh, it's maximized precisely if you are maximized below this threshold for the Radon theorem. And that's it. So this is uh, the theorem. And then you can refine this in various ways to say something about mixed facets that are really important. But th this is the, the essence of the, of the whole theorem. So these, uh, these are called, so this, again, the, the moment curve plays, plays a special role in this, in this construction. And this is also what seems to happen in, 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 this, in, in various problems that are concerning these Minkowski sums of moment, Minkowski sums of certain algebraic curves. Okay, uh, let me stop here. Thank you.